Most of us like a nice, quiet, comfortable life. But in times of great change, that's rarely possible. Think of London during the English Revolution of 1642, when they cut off the head of the king, proclaimed a republic, and civil war broke out. Or Philadelphia during the American Revolution. Or the French Revolution in Paris. Or this city, Shanghai, at the beginning of the 20th century. My name is Philip Short. I'm a historian, and let me tell you, all revolutions are different. So why did the Chinese Revolution take the course it did? The Chinese Communist Party was founded here in Shanghai in 1921. So this is where I've come to find the answer to that question. Let's start in 1895. That was the year that the Qing dynasty suffered a humiliating defeat at the hands of the Japanese in what was afterwards called the First Sino-Japanese War. To patriotic Chinese, it was a wake-up call. How, they asked, could a puny island nation like Japan defeat the mighty Qing Empire? Three years later, in 1898, the Emperor Guangxu approved what were known as the Hundred Day Reforms, so-called because that was how long they lasted. The Emperor wished to correct the weaknesses which had led to China's defeat. But palace conservatives, led by the reactionary dowager Empress Tse Shi, staged a coup d'etat and the reform movement was crushed. Its leaders found refuge abroad or in the foreign concessions here in Shanghai, which from then on began to replace Beijing as the center of progressive opinion in China. Sixteen years later, in 1911, the dynasty was overthrown. Its collapse coincided with the start of the second industrial revolution in China, the age of mass production. Shanghai was at that time the country's biggest industrial center and an economic powerhouse. Its population numbered nearly 2.4 million people, 800,000 more than that of Guangzhou, and almost three times that of Beijing. In the concession areas where the foreigners lived, there was piped water and gas, electricity, telegraph and telephone services, and the era of the motor car had arrived. Change came not just in material things, people's thinking changed too. The new economic system gave rise to new ideas. But to have an impact, new ideas must circulate. And in those days, the main way that new thinking was transmitted was through newspapers. This is a copy of the original edition of the magazine New Youth, with its title in Chinese, and also in French, La Jeunesse. It was founded by Chen Du Shu, a patriotic scholar and teacher who campaigned against the rulers of the Qing dynasty and the warlords who succeeded them. New youth opposed feudalism and called for Mr. Democracy and Mr. Science to replace Confucian ideas. After the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, it put out a special issue to introduce Marxist thought. In the early years of the 20th century, magazines like this one were the equivalent of the internet today. They had the same sort of influence. And like the internet, they used the latest technology available. This is where New Youth was published. Here at the editorial office on Nanchang Road, in what was then the French concession, contributions were received from many different parts of China, edited, and then sent for typesetting and printing. Until the introduction of Western-style printing presses, everything had to be done by hand, 
and no more than at most a few dozen sheets could be drawn from a single plate. By the time New Youth appeared, it was possible to make a print run of as many as 10,000 copies. They were bound in paper wrappers and then sent to the Shanghai Post Office. From here, New Youth was sent all over China by rail. These pigeonholes for each destination on the mail train routes showed the various cities and provinces the postal system served. Among them was Changsha, home to the man who would be remembered as New Youth's most famous contributor. Mao Zedong wrote his first article for New Youth in 1917, when he was still a student at Changsha First Normal School. It was an essay on physical education, in which he recommended, rather controversially, that Chinese should do their daily exercises in the nude. In order to buy New Youth and other progressive newspapers and magazines, which he read voraciously, Mao scrimped on food and clothing. One of his friends wrote later that he had only one tidy set of clothes and seemed not to care what he ate. In 1918, after qualifying as a teacher, he traveled to Beijing where he worked as an assistant in the university library under Li Dajiao. That November, he read Li's seminal article, The Victory of Bolshevism, which made him wonder for the first time whether China could learn from the experience of Soviet Russia. 18 months later, in May 1920, Mao visited Shanghai. He lived here in this house on Anyi Road for three months and during the summer had long discussions with Chen Shu. Chen, he would write later, influenced me perhaps more than anyone else at a critical period of my life. Like many other patriotic young Chinese, Mao was still struggling to find a way. By the following winter, his mind was made up. Only Marxism could save China, he declared. Others might talk about communism. China would put it into practice. <laughs> 